and welcome to Ipsy Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm Ben Edwards, Associate Professor of Law at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, William S. Boyd School of Law. My guest is Eve Hanan, Associate Professor of Law, also at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, William S. Boyd School of Law. We will discuss her draft, A Qualitative Turn in Sentencing. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Ben. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much for coming in and talking about this. I've been you know, reading your work uh, and really it's just opened my eyes. Uh, I know you have about a decade of experience in public defense, and so you've got a much more informed perspective about how the, the system works at the ground level. Uh, and I, I know that this has to inform an enormous amount of your work. Yes, yes. I was a public defender uh, in Boston and in D.C. and Maryland um, before uh, joining academia, and I was always struck by the gap between uh, law on the books and law as it's practiced. Um, at the same time, you know, as we'll talk about as we get into it, I was also struck by how as lawyers we often, as practicing lawyers, limit what we consider relevant to. And uh, even in working with clients, we often don't see everything that's there. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about that more yeah. as we get into the subject. So, so it's mm -hmm. the, the, the piece opened my eyes to essentially how, how blind we are uh, about so much of what goes on. We have some you know, popular narratives uh, around you know, prison, uh, but we, we don't really have much of an understanding of what prison is like, what it's really like for real people who are inside prisons, and whether our, our sentencing policy is, is really well geared to matching the, the appropriate level of punishment to what prison conditions are actually like. Like, where do, where do we get our ideas about prisons as, like, a society? Right. So, so the way that I would shape thinking about that is that on the one hand, we have in popular culture a love of prison narratives, or at least deep curiosity about the prison experience and representations of prison, some of which are more realistic than others. Uh, and so I, I'm thinking about Orange is the New yes, Black right, or right. Oz. Mm -hmm. Um, how, what, what, are, <laughs> yeah. what, what resemblance to reality do these shows have? So prisons vary a lot, um, and I have never been incarcerated, but I've certainly visited you know, many prisons and seen many uh, clients in prisons and talked to them about it. So you know, I think that oftentimes there's some truth to it and some fiction to it, some sensationalism to it, and part of my project uh, you know, is trying to sort out how we can know what prison is like for people in prison. But in terms of the popular narrative of it, even the material that's good in the sense that it is, it is right or accurate in its description of prison, it's almost as if there's a firewall between that emerging body of understanding and what we do in law, in punishment theory, um, in its most abstract form, how we think about punishment, um, like every law student learns in criminal law that there are four justifications for punishment, uh, retribution, deterrence, right. incapacitation, um, and uh, rehabilitation, uh, and that there are limits set by proportionality and parsimony. Um, and so we have that, and what's interesting is we have a whole body of thought around that at an abstract level, and then at a sentencing policy level, and then in the weeds and the nitty gritty of what judges do. And it, for the most part, is not informed by any understanding of what prison is like. So it seems like an oversimplified question to say, does it matter legally? Should it matter? In policy, should it matter what prison is like? But I wanted to pose that broad question and see where it would take me. So, so how often are the is, – is it, is it, would it be the norm that you would see someone who's making sentencing policy – uh, do, are they doing that after having been to prison themselves uh, and spent time in a prison in any real way? So that's, you know, it's funny you should mention that because in an earlier draft, I had started with a clip that I found from a 1984 Nightline show in which um, Chief Justice Berger, then Chief Justice Berger, debated Walter Rideau, who was serving a life sentence at Angola, in, uh, which is a, a notoriously tough prison in Louisiana. He was also the editor-in-chief of The Angolite, which okay. um, is a 
famously wonderful newspaper that was published out of Angola and, and won, won awards um, in okay. journalism circles for it. And they were talking. It was, wasn't much of a debate because they actually agreed on many counts. Um, now, Chief Justice Berger was asked, you know, what would, you know, what should we do about mass incarceration, which at the time wasn't called mass incarceration. Right. And in fact, we had fewer people incarcerated by a long by a long stretch, but um, but he said that lawmakers, policymakers in particular, should be visiting prisons and that they should be inviting formerly incarcerated people to come and testify more before legislative bodies, and that this was essential. That it was essential to understand more about prison in order to make good decisions, punishment decisions at the policy level. Uh, Walter Rudeau did agree with that. Um, some uh, gentle disagreement occurred with some of Justice Berger's other ideas around the role of work in prison, right. uh, which uh, which I won't get into now, but uh, I'll leave for another day. Yeah. So, so it's it seems though that, that is, we've known about this problem for a long right. time mm -hmm. that there's this this understanding gap uh, where, where people who are making these decisions and setting sentencing policy uh, don't. You haven't been to prison themselves. I haven't haven't spent much time in one. What, what, what do legislators think about when they're, let's say, we're, we're cooking up a new crime, uh, which is to say, <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna we're gonna criminalize something. Sounds uh, like the federal system. Yeah, yeah. Yes. We're, we're we're gonna say, let's say, um, uh -huh. you know, we want. Um, uh, imagine, you know, we, we don't want to just rely on wire fraud anymore for uh, insider trading, and we want um, we want to create a specific insider trading crime criminal statute. We put put that together. How do we decide how many years? Right. So the system now, if you think about punishment as there are some non-incarcerative options like probation, and then there's incarceration, which qualitatively is understood simply as a loss of liberty, removing someone and putting them in a position where they lose their liberty. And then there's the death penalty in some instances. So in this range of incarceration, the variable, I, I create an equation which I say is loss of liberty times the amount of time equals the punishment. Right. So the variable is simply the punishment, which could be measured in the federal system in months or in most state systems in terms of years. It's often talked about in terms of years um, instead of months. And there's no anchor for it. So if you think of um, a boat anchoring, right. um, you know, uh, cognitive psychologists talk about a problem in negotiation, in oh, yeah. financial negotiation, the anchoring problem. You know, the first person who says 10,000, that's going to be dropping an anchor into the ocean, and all of the other numbers are going to revolve around 10,000. So something similar happens in sentencing. So whatever we understand a sentence to have been, however that first came about, you're not going to see much variation from that. So far as you see a variation, you're, you are going to, and, and Bill Stuntz famously pointed this out in his um, Pathological Politics of Criminal Law, you often just see a ratcheting up. So you give an example of a new crime. Usually a new crime comes about because there's something you know, that's happened. Right. And it's not criminal, or they don't think that there's been enough punishment, so let's make a new crime. Right. There's going to be more punishment. Let's explicitly capture something. Right. Or legislatures will say, well, robbery is a crime, but now there are carjackings. So we're going to make that a new crime, and we're going to say carjacking is punishable by 20 years to life. because Carjacking yeah. is a special robbery. Right, exactly. Or take the same crime and just increase the punishment. Um, now, it isn't the whole story because we are seeing some... Um, uh, smart on crime initiatives to reduce punishments for certain crimes. That was part of the First Step Act for some of the drug-related offenses. But it's a much more difficult process than passing laws which increase um, the amount of time that somebody spends or ratchet up right. as opposed to leveling down. So, so the also an anchor also in the sense that if you think about um, a meaningful. Like, what would it actually mean? What would be the right punishment? There's no there there. There's nothing quantitatively to understand about that. It's simply just a random drop in the ocean that's only understood in terms of ordinarily ranking it against other similar crimes, worse crimes, less serious crimes. So yeah. so there, when we think about our sentencing policy, it's, it's as if we're putting people in prison for an amount of time that's possibly related to some theoretical objectives. Uh, but the way we pick that amount of time is just what other people have been imprisoned for before, and we sort of just drift upward from there. 
Yes, exactly. Right. What other people have been, right, the past and also an ordinal ranking. So if you think about um, proportionality, it does the punishment fit the crime or traditional like retributivist proportionality uh, is really asking, looking at the culpability of the defendant, the seriousness of the crime, and comparing that to um, what sort of punishment happens and trying to make sure that the punishment is no greater than what is um, is fair or just deserts um, and also no less. So in that, if you're thinking about prison sentences, really the only way that we figured out to talk about that is in terms of comparing uh, to similar crimes, comparing to more serious crimes or less serious crimes, so you have an ordinal ranking system. You see this in the federal guidelines, you know, as, as clearly as you could anywhere else, right. um, where it'll involve other factors. So there's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very quantitative system. Um, Malcolm Feely and Jonathan Simon, you know, wrote about that and, and how everything has a quantified variable, and more recently Mona Lynch. Um, including um, the criminal history score. So there's right. a score for that. There's numbers for everything, and you come up with a number of months at the end. Yeah. Yes. So, so. It, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it seems like there are these norms that develop around sentencing, and they, they tend to be self-perpetuating, both at the, the sentencing policy level from legislators and putting together the federal guidelines. But in state courts, if you have you, – you, you touch on you know, state prosecutors and judges – they, they sort of have their own norms about what uh, what a trespass or what a, you yes. know, a particular crime yeah. you know gets in that jurisdiction. So if you go to any courthouse in this country, the, um, the the professionals who staff that courthouse know what a case is worth. And when new attorneys come in, baby attorneys come in, right. one of the, the first lessons they learn is what a case is worth, oftentimes based on the police report since most things plead out you know right, right. away. Um, and so you have these norms that establish, but where it starts to seem very strange is around the edges where um, you have someone who is sentenced outside of that or system of ordinal ranking. And I use the example of the Manafort sentencing, right. his first sentencing, um, to, that was described as just under four years. And, and my point is not, is that enough or not enough right. for his crimes. My point is, what do we mean by that? How would we as a society know what four years in prison mean? Well, we only know compared to other crimes, other people and the sentences they received. Um, and so because we don't know, our only way of thinking about justice is to level it all off. But right. that could be leveled up so everyone gets more time. <laughs> or it could be leveled down, but we never really get at any kind of anything that's non-numerical and qualitative to understand, you know, what it really means to send someone to prison. So what I'm talking about here is an impoverished conceptual framework, right. which is hobbling us in our efforts to think wisely and deeply about sentencing. So, so people reacted, uh, and I'm not a, a, a Manafort uh, uh, apologist or fan, but people reacted yes, with a lot uh -huh. of hostility uh, at this notion that he was he was somehow you know getting off with with just four years. And there was a line in your your, your draft that um, I wanted to read because it, it seemed it was it was pretty poignant. Uh, it's, we live in a country that can say only four years because we sentence people to life for nonviolent crimes, and because and this is the point of this article we make sentencing decisions on only the thinnest quantitative data time. And, and so what do, you, what, do you, what do you really mean there? Yes. So if we only think about the numbers, there's, there's really no structure which would keep the numbers from, from ever spiraling upward or way to think about what serving time is like. And, you know, it, the Ewing case comes to mind, which was the case um, which in, in many ways spelled I don't know if it's a death knell, but it definitely signaled the possible end of um, looking at proportionality for long sentences for adults um, uh, incarcerated. We've had some, uh, since then we've had some in the juvenile context, but um, Ewing um, stole golf clubs right. and he was sentenced under the habitual offender statute in uh, California to 25 years to life. And it went up to the Supreme Court um, uh, as, as an Eighth Amendment challenge right. uh, that this was disproportionate for the crime. Certainly, yeah. and the court didn't really disagree that this is disproportionate to the crime of stealing golf clubs. 
but the state, but the court said there are other interests at stake. They could feel that it would be, you know, he could be held for incapacitative reasons because he's a repeat offender, and we're really not going to look at these numbers here. So two pieces, they were looking at the goals of sentencing and saying, we'll take an agnostic view on which goal. But the other part is that there was sort of no meat on the bones of what it means to spend 25 years to life in prison. You know, nothing was there. Yeah. So, so thinking about how this comes into play, I think there's a reason why legal actors and legal theorists have a hard time thinking about the experience of prison in a way that's relevant to sentencing is that we just we don't have a framework and what we some of the work that needs to be done is building that framework so if yeah oh go ahead so yes. so 20, 25 mm-hmm. years or four years or five years five years in prison for one person is different than five years in prison for another um some of this you know, I, I, how much of this do we do we take i think five years in prison for someone who's in their 70s if you're thinking about the remaining percentage of their expected life uh, it's an enormous, you know, you're looking at, you know, 90% uh, or something of like how many, the remaining years they have alive. But it's, it's still a, you know, it's a small. Yes. So it's a, yeah. it always depends mm-hmm. on how you, you look at this uh, and your, your experience within the prison population is going to be different depending on, on where you are in that range. And how do you, I mean, is this something we can take into account at the policy level or how do we even start thinking about So this. there is an issue around variation, and I do want to flag um, uh, a law review article from, must be about a decade ago now, um, by um, Adam Colburn, which uh, received uh, criticism, and but a lot of provocative um, thought about the subjective experience of imprisonment is definitely part of the punishment. So it's definitely, the punishment, some people are going to experience prison is more punishing than others. And um, there's no logical reason why that uh, that that shouldn't matter in trying to calculate punishment. There are practical problems. So, so that was the perspective. Right. Um, I I think that there's a lot going on there to unpack. I'm going to put it on the back burner right. a bit in this conversation um, because sorting out individual sentencing is one question, and then sorting out you know w- what can be said about prison in general is another question. Um, and you could imagine the problems that will arise in individual sentencing if you try to know what people's experience will be and the ways in which bias right. and um, it's hard uh, to do can factor in as well in terms of a judge imagining. So one way to think about that is, and I think this is worth mentioning and flagging at the individual level, and why that's that's not the center of my project right, right. now. It's, it's different, but is um, one way to look at Manafort is that. In a case with a, a wealthier, well-to-do um, white defendant, um, it's easier for um, judges who often usually come from privileged backgrounds as well to imagine what prison will be like for Manafort and right. to be concerned about what prison will be like. Whereas when a defendant comes before the court, who, to borrow a word from um, uh uh, Gonzalez Van Cleve, who wrote Crook County, that right. many uh, in the Chicago courts, they look at the defendants as defutured. People who don't have futures where it doesn't, they don't think, what is prison going to be like for this person? I'm just going to send an empathy gap. Right, right. So if you're thinking about sensitive defendants, there's a real risk of the weighing only, sensitivity. The only, the only ones whose sensitivities will care about are right, the, right. the privileged so, white so men. So maybe we're already caring what prison is like yeah. um, for... Um, uh, the Stanford rape case, maybe he's already thinking, what's prison going to be like for this person in a way right. that, um, I don't want to say that this is true about Persky because I think there's a lot of interesting evidence that came out about his sentencing in other ways, but um, but that's the, that's the concern. Um, and I think it's a legitimate concern. But if you take it up a step, there's two epistemological issues. Right. And the epistemological issues on more like the, well, on the policy level, and even before that, on the developing punishment theory levels, those issues are, first, what role does phenomenological experience, the meaning that people attach, the experience people have in social settings, what role does that have in our collective social understanding of what something is, what something right. we do to people is? And then if we can understand what that is and how that can fill out our conceptual framework in an epistemological sense, um, that can also influence sentencing policy. So that's one piece. And then a separate epistemological issue is, can we know what prison is like, like given that it's so variable and that people experience it in variable ways? I think, so. I think on the merits, you're, you're absolutely right that 
we need to understand what we're doing. And when, when we're collectively punishing people and sending them to prison, and we don't, we, we give them this number of years and we forget about them, we don't actually think about or really even, even attempt to understand what that experience is going to be like for them. Uh, like how, how do we get a better sense for what prison is really like for people? Right. So I think I, mean, I call it um, a hermeneutical lacuna. <laughs> and um, I, so I'll start with this. I, I am relying here on some interesting work that was done by Miranda Fricker, uh, a philosopher. And her example of a hermeneutical lacuna is in um, the sexual harassment context where before we understood sexual harassment the way we do today, um, or the way we did even in the right. late 70s, early 80s, when we started um, thinking about it more, um, if a woman at work experienced um, a boss you know, making passes at her, even conditioning employment on her being responsive, the words that she would use and everyone would use were you know, that he was flirtatious, frisky, you know, these were like the terms, right? There was like no uh, way for her to talk about her experience or for right. it to be heard as what we understand now sexual harassment to be. So you could say that there was um, a failure of meaning making, a conceptual failure collectively to have yeah. a, a meaningful structure to understand what that interaction was. I guess the only perspective that our society understood was the perspective of the boss. Right. Yes. And so that's why the project of filling in that hermeneutical lacuna is that she and other women start talking about what it is like, what it is like to work for someone like that, right. what it is like to have your work conditioned on that or to be in a hostile work environment and come up with their terminology, their way of talking about it, and then to be listened to by the powers that be or to be part of the decision-making process so that their perspective on what that is like actually becomes part of society's new hermeneutical construction of what happens in those right. interactions with bosses. So, so I'm so, going to take that, yes. Race. On, on, yeah. on mm -hmm. one of the things to, to listen to, you mentioned uh -huh. uh, something I hadn't heard of, uh, but I think I want to go listen to, uh, ear hustle. Yes. Uh, and it's, yeah. it's a way to sort of, sort of hear in the voices of, of your prisoners what it's like. Right. What so, is, what is yeah. this so Ear Hustle, Ear Hustle is, a, is a podcast out of San Quentin, and um, it is a partnership. I think it's a public radio partnership, um, and it's very well produced. And, you know, it doesn't focus on the sensational aspects of imprisonment, which oftentimes come up in, you mentioned Oz, right. shows like yeah. that, which can be very sensationalized, but just on day-to-day -day issues, even just like how to shave, how to maintain hygiene, right. um, uh, there's humor in it, and there's sort of the daily life. One of the interesting aspects of pot podcasts like that, the journalism that you can read, there's less journalism now, but the old, right. um, I was able to get some archived Angolites from the 70s and read through them, is that we essentially, if we have like close to 2 million people in prisons, it's been called like the fourth city. Like yeah. If you oh, yeah. think about it, it's like if an um, so the U.S. the the right. You, yeah. you, you you probably have a better grasp on this than I do, but I, I I'm aware that we incarcerate more people uh, than any other country in the world, and also at much higher rates than any other place. In the like millions, millions more. Right, and it's although prisons differ, even in a prison, you'll have different experiences based on classification level, right. levels of security, and many other variables. Warden. <laughs> you know, right. can change in a, a day, really, what the prison experience is like. But that there are similarities, um, and it is like almost as it's a city, like yeah. where it's a, um, you know, the so nearly the size uh, an of an archipelago, <laughs> almost, the prison yeah. archipelago, like right, uh, right. Kind of like the American Gulag archipelago, right. And I think that you can say things about it and important things about it that um, that derive from the memoirs and the journalism and the writing and the poetry and the podcasts of prisoners. Um, that I think you can say something about it. Both, there is variation, but say the way we can say something about the experience of minors, or we can say something about the experience of being sexually harassed at work, or whatever it might be, you can get some general. Um, and, and if you use that in a framework to build meaning, I, I don't know where that ends exactly. I can talk about some of the challenges that that would pose to traditional punishment theory and proportionality analysis, but it also could end um, in a project that many are talking about in my field, which is 
we need some better theories. Right. <laughs> we don't have good yeah. theories. You, We're thinking about incapacitation and retribution, and right. none of them make sense. Um, they, none of them explain what we're doing, and none of them are enough to guide policymakers and judge, uh, judges. So, so some of those theories are like dignity-based. So the, the sense yeah. I have uh-huh. is, is that you have this, this thread, uh, you know, sort of the understanding the experience of people in prison, and as you, as you pull on it and pull more of those perspectives into your work, you can, you can help develop a better understanding of what's, what's really happening, and that can help sort of shape the broader policy conversation about what we should be doing. Yes, that's right. And on a theoretical level, you know, if you think about some of the criminal justice reform work that's being done today is very empirically driven. And there are critics of that, but uh, and which have very valid points. I support the idea of empirically checking what we do in law. You know, right. In our theories and our understandings, there are many hidden empirical assumptions underneath it. Like, for example, uh, punishment deters crime. Uh, right. it, yeah. <laughs> that would be one, right? Which we can challenge, right? Yeah. Um, or certain, um, or uh, you know, one of our, our our colleagues, um, yeah. Professor Sarah Gordon, writes about, you know, well, we have problem solving courts um, trying to rehabilitate, but they don't have evidence based practices. That, okay, so there there are many ways in which we're using empirical tests, but our understanding of empiricism is still very quantitative. It's just right. what are the numbers? Is there recidivism? Empiricism ultimately doesn't mean that. You know, the Aristotelian sense of empiricism was what can be known by the senses. Right. And William James, again, famously said, you know, everything is really empirical first. It's what's known by the senses. So we don't, we've added some voices into the criminal justice system to think about it, but we, we are missing this whole contingent of thinking about there's, there's empiricism involved in it's not phenomenologically just re- understanding what's... It's not just yeah. recidivism rates we care about, but also the, right. the, the people right. who what are the in this system, yeah. what they are experiencing. Mm-hmm. And it may be possible in other areas of science to do things by the numbers, but in social science, um, so I borrow from epistemology, but also from social science, and um, the move, and now we have, a, in fact, a, a, I don't know if it's a, it's not really a sea change, but there's a renewed interest in criminology and sociology in the in the qualitative as well or mixed methodology that we do need numbers but we also need to really understand the qualitative human experiences that are happening you can't really understand society without the qualitative and you can't get good theories that you can use in sociology to test new things without your case studies and without your qualitative understanding of what is happening in people's lives well thank you so much Mm -hmm. for for doing this work and for coming on the podcast Thanks. Charles Bukowski once said, I don't like jail. They got the wrong kind of bars in there. Prisoners spend a lot of time in the library. I guess they enjoy escape literature. Here's John Prine with a song from his second album, Sweet Revenge. John's talking here about Christmas in prison and the food being real good, turkeys and pistols carved out of wood. He wants to play a chess game with someone he admires. He's thinking about a picnic in the rain after a prairie fire. John captures the isolation and loneliness of celebrating Christmas away from your loved ones. Sometimes it's not such a bad thing. Here's John Prine. Christmas in prison and the food was real good we had turkey and pistols carved out of wood and I dream of her always even when I don't dream her name's on my tongue and her blood's in my strength wait a while eternity oh my nature's got nothing on me Run to me, come to me now We're rolling, my sweetheart We're blowing by God She 
She reminds me of a chess game with someone I admire or a picnic in the rain after a prairie fire. Her heart is as big as this old goddamn gel and she's sweeter than saccharin at a drugstore safe. Wait a while, eternity. Old Mullen Nature's got nothing on me. Come to me, run to me, come to me now. We're rolling, my sweetheart, we're flowing by God. Searchlight in the big yard swings round with the gun and spotlights, snowflakes like the dust in the sun. It's Christmas in prison, there'll be music tonight. I'll probably get homesick. I love you, good night. Wait a while, eternity. Oh, my nature's got nothing on me. To me, run to me, come to me now. We're ruling my sweetheart, we're flowing by God. John Prine, born in Maywood, Illinois. John was discovered by Chris Christopherson when he was a mailman. The right guy at the right time. Probably delivered his mail to him, I don't know. Chris never answered my letters. <laughs> 